So this continuum medium is going to move in the space a long time. For instance, starting from this point, this continuum medium is going to move and you want to describe the motion of this continuum medium. When I say motion, I also include something that we are going to call deformation. This is what we call a rigid body motion, but this is what we call a deformation. Okay, we'll see how do we distinguish between both. But anyway, either within the deformation process or within the rigid body motion process, the particles of the continuum medium are going to move. So it's important to say that the continuum medium is supposed to be made of particles. But, but these particles are continuous. So around any particle, in the neighborhood of any particle, there is always another particle. That's what we mean by continuous. Okay? Also, for mathematical description, we're going to assume that at every point of this continuum medium, there is a specific particle. Particle, how many particles are there? Inf infinite number. Okay? What is the size of any particle? Infinitesimal. So, let's consider the continuum medium, and then we are going to define what are points of this continuum medium. And we are having two definitions. One is material points, another is spatial points. So what is a material, po a material point? I said that, every, that the continuum is made of particles, infinite particles, infinitely close to each other, so that may a continuum, a continuum uh, matter, but every of these particles, every of these infinitesimal particles, is going to be considered a material point. And the word material says this, a material point is one particle of the continuum medium. One of those <coughs> infinite particles that I could consider that constitute this continuum medium. What is a spatial point? Well, spatial points are spots in space. So for describing the, 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 the properties of the continuum medium, I'm going to uh, use a system of coordinates, typically a, co a Cartesian system of coordinates. And in, every, in this system, every point of a space, the infinitesimal point of a space, inf infinite point of a space, of course, so every of these points is called a spatial point. Okay. So the word spatial refers to points of space. The word material refers to points of the material. Material saying our continuum medium. Okay? And that's the word that we will use to describe both issues, which are different. In what sense? So let's consider that this is an abstraction, this sort of potato. Many times we use the word potato to say that. Is our 3D in general, continuum medium, which is, is, is described in a certain space, in terms of a certain basis, and so on. So the continuum ma medium is made of particles, particles. And along the motion, along the movement of the continuum medium, that part, those particles move along the space. Okay? So, when I move this continuum medium, every material point, every particle, moves along a space. That particle here, that at, let's say, if you are interested in a, in a, in a, in a s range of times, starting from, from an initial time, T0, to a final time, T, capital T. So at the initial time, the time at which I start studying my, my body, then this particle occupies a certain position that can be expressed in terms of coordinates, which is this capital X. Okay? Look, here I'm using capital X. Why? Because that's a rule that we are going to uh, follow from now on. In general, everything that refers to particles, that refers to particles, that's going to be important, we are going to denote that in capital letters. And everything that refers to space, we are going to describe it in small letters. Okay? So capital letters will be, in general, deserved whenever I can, uh, dessert, uh, sorry, uh, be used by to describe something which is associated to a given particle, to particles, to material, and small letters would be used to define 
something which is referred to space. So we can say that this particle, which has a position which is characterized by the vector position going from the, that position of the particle to the origin of the system of coordinates at time t equal to zero, which is called reference time, moves along a space, along times, and at a certain time t in the interval of interest, not at the end, it's an intermediate time, the same particle occupies another position, okay, which is different. So another spatial point. Okay? So how do we define this position? Well, by a vector of position that joins that point with the origin of coordinates. And I know this position by small x. Okay? That is, 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 is saying that this is a specific position of the particle at a time in the interval of interest. So, so now considering that for all particles, of the infinite particles of the continuum medium, Every particle at the origin occupies a certain positions in the space, and the set of positions occupied by the particles of the continuum medium at the original time is called the initial configuration. And as we move, if we call configuration, the set of positions, of spatial positions, occupied by the particles of the, the infinite particles of the continuum medium a long time, in every time, at every time of the, mo of the movement, there is a different configuration. The configuration is the locus, locus meaning log geometric, lar geometrico, the locus of all positions, of the spatial positions, occupied by the particles of the continuum medium at a given time. At a given time, so you have an initial configuration with this depth. Then when I move, in, at every time I have another configuration. What is the configuration? The locus of the part of the position of the particles at that time. And then if I continue, continue moving, moving, then I have different configurations until arriving to the final time of the analysis. So the word configuration refers to the locus of the positions occupied by the material points, the particles, of the continuous me medium at a given time. Okay? So there are as many configurations. How many configurations? Infinite, because, I mean, we can just have infinite times in any continuous interval as this. Sorry. Any, so we have infinite configurations. And among, among them, we are going to distinguish two spe special configurations. One is the initial configuration the initial configuration that we are going to call omega zero. Zero referring to the initial time that in general, t zero, that in general will be taken by, by z as zero, but it could also take it eventually uh, different, differently than from zero. So the initial configuration, that is the position, the, the locus of the position of all particles of the continuum medium at the initial time of the analysis is going to be called the initial or also sometimes is called the reference configuration, and also sometimes is, called to, is going to call undeformed configuration. Maybe the properest name is initial configuration. Reference and undeformed will be used in other contexts. Okay, this configuration changes a long time. And now we are going, at methodologi methodologically, we are going to stop our analysis in a certain time small t, in the interval of interest. So at this time, we are going to study what happens with the continuum medium, what are its properties, and what are everything in that continuum medium. So that configuration at the time that, what do you call the present time? The present time is the time that we are interested in studying. That would be called the present configuration and that will be denoted omega. So whenever we see omega, that means a certain configuration, which is not the initial, which is done at the present time. The present time is the time in which I'm studying the, 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 the continuum medium. So we have defined material particles, material points, sorry, spatial points. Material points are the, the, the particles themselves. 
the spatial points are points of space. We have seen that the, 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 the spatial points occupied by the material points at the reference configuration, at the, at the reference time, is what we're going to uh, call the initial configuration. And the configuration, the locus of the spatial points occupied by the material points at the current time, is what we're going to call the current configuration. And in between, there are infinite configurations that, I mean, every time has a different configuration. OK? So according to that, we also are going to define some coordinates definition. OK? So the original position of the particles, which is called the, uh, the, 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 the position of the particles at the reference configuration, is given by a certain vector of coordinates. This vector will have three coordinates in the system of reference that we are using. OK? So this, for a given particle, for a given particle, the coordinates of this particle at the, ref at the reference time, at the initial time, is going to be the material coordinates of the particle. So what are the material coordinates of the par particles? The coordinates, the three coordinates, x1, x2, x3, or independently I will use either this notation or, in, or, or well, x, y, z, are the coordinates, the spatial coordinates of the particles at the reference configuration. Not the spatial one, the coordinates of the, of, the, of the particles at the reference configuration. And look, that will be given with capital letters, either x1, x2, x3, or x, capital X, capital Y, capital Z. Okay? Whenever we see capital letters, that means that we are referring to coordinates of a particle at the reference time, at the initial position. OK? OK. What happens? As I said, the particles, the particles, or given particle, move from the original coordinates, from the original position, and then move along time. And that's what we are trying to describe, to describe the motion. OK? So what are the, the coordinates of the, that particle, the same particle? At the current time t, well, different. In general, will be different. So that particle placed just here in that point, for instance, initially has some position with respect to the axis of coordinates we display here. And then at the current time, the, the time I'm studying, it has some other coordinates. So we'll denote these coordinates as a spatial coordinates. And of course, there will be also three coordinates x1, x2, x3, or in the, indifferently, I will use also the notation x, y, small x, small y, and small z. So we have now defined for the same particle different two definitions of coordinates. One is the material coordinates of a, partic of a particle, which is that for this particle that is moving along, along time and space, is those coordinates that the particle had at the reference configuration, OK? And they are denoted by capital letters. And the same particle, a long time, has a number of or infinite spatial, different spatial coordinates, because it's moving along time. At the given time, the time of interest, the current time, we'll name these spatial coordinates of the same particle, OK? And they will be denoted by, that's important, that you know this will denote the vector of coordinates, that's a vector of coordinates, so a vector, the components of a vector, uh, components of a vector, that is the vector that defines the position of the, co of the particle at the reference time, at the initial time, and this is a vector of components, three components in 3D, that refers to the vector of position of this particle at the current time. Okay? Well, so, this lets us to go to the concept of equations of motion. Equations of motion are equations, mathematical equations, that describe the different positions, different uh, spatial coordinates or spatial positions of a particle a long time. So conceptually, the best way to define this is say, well, I want to know, I want to find a way 
to describe for a given particle, every particle could be identified with a label, for instance. That could be, I could number the particles, particle one, particle two, particle three, particle four. What is the problem of this? That there are infinite particles. That there are infinite particles. So I cannot, cannot use this system because I, I don't have too much number, too many numbers to describe infinite particles. There are infinite particles for that. For, I cannot use as label the num a number of, for every particle. Okay, I, can, I could use, for instance, colors. I could see the particle blue, the particle green, the particle in gray, the particle in yellow. Again, I would soon exhaust the possible colors and I wouldn't have numbered the, all the particles. So I need something, a label, to identify the particle that univocally identifies every particle and that cannot, I mean, that, that uh, can describe all particles. There are many ways of doing that. But maybe the simplest way is to identify the particle level, the, the, the label of the particle in terms of its material coordinates. So at the reference configuration, every particle had some specific position, a specific for it, which corresponds to three material coordinates. And these material coordinates do not change along the motion of the particle. But why? Because they are identified as the coordinates at the reference configuration. When the particle moves, what change are the spatial coordinates. But the material coordinate is something that identifies the particle univocally, uniquely at the reference configuration. So in general, we will use what we call the cano canonical description, description of the motion in which the, 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 the particle is, identified, is identif identified by a label which is precisely the material coordinates of the particle. Okay? So the material coordinates of the particle is a vector. Look, sometimes I use this notation. Instead of writing a column vector to indicate, to indicate the three components, I write a, 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 a horizontal vector, a row vector, but I put here the transpose. That means that you should look at that as a vector, as a, ve as a column vector. So this identify the position of the, uh, the label of the vector, and then the motion equations then provide what is the spatial position of this particle, so identified by the material label, by the material coordinate, at every time t. So this is a three functions, so to speak. One function for the first coordinate, one function for the second coordinate, one function, one mapping for the third coordinate, that for every time t, provides what is the three spatial coordinates of the particle, identifying the particle by the material coordinates, capital one, capital X one, capital X two, capital X three, and of course the time. So this is what our goal now, to identify these three functions, phi one, phi two, phi three, that once I know them by replacing here the material coordinates of every particle, the label of the particle, and the time returns the spatial coordinates. That's the, 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 the way that we are going to deal with the problem of providing equations of motions. So equations of motion in general are equations that provide the spatial coordinates in terms of every particle identified by a label. There are many days, ways of doing that. The most specific is when the label of the particle is, is identified or the particle is given the label which is the three material coordinates of the particle and time. In that case, that those equations, uh, those uh, motion equations, equations of motion, are called in canonical form. But it's also possible, uh, we'll see some, some uh, cases, in which we use a description of the motion, a question of the motion, where the description of the particle is not given by the material coordinates, but, but by something else. We'll see the cases. Okay? So it's also possible. But in general, 
we will consider that we can also pass from this description to that description by some algebraic operations. Okay, let's go ahead. Of course, these are mathematical equations. These equations of motions are mathematical equations that provide, so to speak, cap small x1, small x2, small x3, in terms, for every time, of capital X1, capital X2, capital X3. So there are three equations with three unknowns, so to speak. So these equations, imagine that we can solve them so that we can isolate from these equations capital X1, capital X2, capital X3 in terms of small x1, small x2, small x3, and time. So we will obtain something that looks like that. Some equations, some functions, that return for every spatial position, for every small x, the label, the material coordinates of that particle that at this time occupies this spatial position. These are called the inverse equations of motion. So the inverse equations of motion is something that can be taken just by manipulating the direct equations of motions, those here, and isolating, inverting them, isolating the material coordinates in terms of the spatial coordinates. Okay? Physically, what, what, what do they mean? These equations return, these uh, inverse equations, return what are the label, what is the label, or in other words, what are the material coordinates of a particle that at the current time, time is occupying a, a spatial position which is small x. So for every of this position of the space at a given time, if I replace this equation here, in this equation here, the spatial position, certain position of the space, and the time, what I will obtain is precisely the material coordinate. So what was the position that this particle occupied at the reference configuration. So these are the inverse equation of motions that, you know, we follow here the rule that we can see in the book many times, that we give here the compact notation, so that, that refers to vectors, vectors as entities that typically do not depend on systems of reference, and here are components, the three components of this expression. That is the initial expression of this equation, like in here, you have the initial, and here is the compact equation. This is where physics is. This is easier sometimes to work algebraically with it. So they are equivalent whenever I keep fixed the system of coordinates. When I move the system of coordinates, the system of reference, then these equations keep still valid because they are not depending on system of coordinates, but these coordinates can change. Okay, because then when I change the system of coordinates. But in general, we consider that the system of coordinates is something which is fixed, the reference basis is fixed. So these are two ways of expressing the same, the same uh, reality, the same equation. Okay, so we have the set of motion of a continuum medium. That continuum medium starts initially in a reference configuration, moves along time, in a given time, the, the, the current time, we have what you call the actual or the present configuration, and we want to define what is the equation of all particles that, 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 that provide the, the, the motion of those particles along this movement, and then for this we can do directly, by the direct equation of motions, that for every particle and time returns the spatial position of this particle. Or the inverse equation, which for every sp uh, po spatial point and time returns the material coordinate that is the particle identified by the uh, material coordinate. Okay? Well, so our goal in, in this chapter will deal essentially with that, the equations of motion. Okay, so the point is that, imagine that I just go to the, bar, to, the, to the blackboard and then I write some equations relating capital X, capital E, Y, capital Z, and small x, small y, and small z, and time. I invent them, I invent them. 
could that be representative of the motion of a continuum medium? So any possible invented equations of motion, or equations, three equations of space and time, can they represent a real motion of a continuum medium? If I invent them, all them represent, well, that's not true. They are same conditions that are required for a certain function, three functions, phi, of a space and time, phi of a, X, a capital XT, in order that they can represent the real motion of a continuum medium. First one, look, the equations of motion, direct equation of motion, return the position, the, the material, co the, the, the coordinates of the particle at the time t. <coughs> what happens if I replace here time, reference time, time, time t0 or 0? What, 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 what happens is I put in that those equations 0. What should I obtain? At this side. If I put that here, 0, what I, is these are equations of motion, I should obtain here the spatial position of the particle at t equals zero. But this t equals zero, this spatial position of the particle at t equals zero, are what we term capital X. So when I replace in, in the equations of motion zero, I have to obtain the material coordinates in the canonical expression. So that's a condition. Otherwise, I mean, that is not representative of, of equations of motion. Look, then these functions phi so have to be continuous. Why continuous? Because we assume that the motion of the particles is the, 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 the medium is continuous, so it can be represented, and the motion and the, their properties can be represented by continuous function. So it's continuous. Look, another condition is the following. Physically, we can say that the same particle at the reference configuration so uh, one particle that is occupied a certain position, capital X, at the reference configuration, cannot be at time t at two different times. So one particle cannot be in two different special positions at any time. This can be just in a modern theory, which is quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, that's true. But in, in, in classic mechanics, that's not true. One point, one, the mass, is occupying a single position in the space a long time. So that means that this mapping, this uh, function, should be injected to inject into the in the into the, 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 the space the, the, in, a, in a unique way. And otherwise, a, a counterwise. So if I have a point of a space, at that point there is just one particle, not two particles. So the point is that the same particle has to occupy one single position, space position at every time, and counterwise, the same position of the time is only occupied by a single particle. And this translates into what we call mathematically that these, uh, that these uh, functions, the equations of motions, have to fulfill, uh, have to be very univocal. By numerical meaning that, that for every x, for every x that I put here, sorry, here, for every capital X that I put here, I just have to take one single small x. And the same way, for every uh, x here comes from just one single capital X. Okay? So that's something. How is that warranted? Well, if you look at mathematics, not useful for you know, meaning the point here. That can be proven that a given function is bionivocal if the, what is called the determinant of a certain matrix, the matrix is called the Jacobian matrix, is different from zero. That's proven mathematically that is a sufficient condition for a function to be bionivocal. So what I have to prove for, the, for this invented um, expression of the continuity equations what I have to prove is that this determinant is different from zero. Look, this determinant is a two indices, so that means that it's, it's I identify the rows and J identify the columns. So taking derivatives of this, of this phi I with respect to x1, x2, x3, 
obtain the first column, taking derivatives of phi 2 with respect to x1, x2, x3, the second column, taking derivatives of phi 3 with respect to x1, x2, x3, I just the third column, this constitutes a matrix, I can take the derivative of this matrix, and this matrix has to be different from zero in order to be bionivocal. Okay? Third, the Jacobian, this, this is what the determinant of this uh, matrix that is called the Jacobian, and we'll denote that, we'll use that for several purposes, we'll denote it by J, has to be different from zero, but also more than this. Different from zero means it can be positive or negative. I anticipate, and that's something that will prove, that this Jacobian has to be strictly greater than zero. Because we then will see that if it was a smaller than zero, that would mean that the density of the material at the time that this determinant becomes smaller than zero gets negative. Just take, take trust me, we'll prove that in a certain time. And, but then we see that we are applying a more strict condition than that, the condition that this is strictly positive. Okay? So these are conditions, not, we'll see now that we can invent a number of them.